to worship, to all searching for grace and truth, Amen. and see, to all searching for meaning and purpose, come Amen. and see, to all searching for abundant life, come Amen. and see. Let us worship God together. Please join me in the invocation. Lord, open our hearts to the surprising ways in which you offer to us your love and your presence. Help us to truly believe in the wondrous ways that you work in our lives. Give us hearts and spirits for service to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first hymn is found in the red hymnal number 413, My Father Planned It All.
may be seated. We're called to confession. God, who knit us in the womb, knows us completely. God inclines toward us and hears our cry. Assured of God's grace and steadfast love, let us confess our sin together as we pray together, saying, Merciful God, we confess that we have been timid and unreliable witnesses of Jesus Christ. Forgive us for the times we have stayed silent in the face of injustice and hate, for the times our actions have not matched our beliefs, for the times we have hoarded our abundance, for the times we have turned away from your children in need, for the many ways we fail to follow Jesus, forgive us. Invite us again to come and see and to abide in your presence so that we may be transformed and renewed. Empower us to witness with our words and lives to the love and grace we've experienced in Jesus Christ. Amen. In this time of silence, take a few moments for your own private prayer of confession. our assurance of pardon. Hear the good news of the gospel. God will not withhold mercy from us. The steadfast love and faithfulness of the Lord is with us now and forever. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. music this morning is by Martha Denkenberger at the piano.
a prayer of illumination. God of wisdom, by the power of your Holy Spirit, invite us into your word. Give us ears to hear, wisdom to understand, and courage to answer your call to us today. Amen. Pierce. This morning's Old Testament reading comes to us from a various selection from Genesis. Um, we're going over the story of Joseph this morning, and so to encapsulate it, there's a number of passages. First one is from Genesis chapter 37, verses 17 to 20. And the man said, they have departed from here, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Now when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, look, the streamers come and come. Therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into the pit. And we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. And now Genesis 41, 39 to 41. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and as wise as you. You shall be over my house and my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Genesis 45, 18. Bring forth your father and your households and come to me, and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you will eat of the fat of the land. Genesis 46, verses two to four. Then God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. So he said, I am God, the God of your father, do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will surely bring you up again, and Joseph will be put his hand on your eyes. And then finally, Genesis 50, verse 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people. The New Testament reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 26, 28 through 30. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that, not, that even Solomon in all his glory was not as arrayed like one of these. Now if God so closes, clothes the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Sermon this morning is the providence of God. Recently, my wife and I were in Japan after what seemed like a very long three years. Though it was great to be back, we were on a mission to better understand Japanese Christians. As I inquired with the Japanese about their faith, one constant seemed to stand out. The providence of God was strongly seen in how these people came to know the Lord. Before we look at the story of Joseph and the overwhelming evidence of the providence of God at work in his life, I just wanna take a moment to better understand what the providence of God is. Miller Erickson in Christian Theology says, the providence of God means his continuing action of God in preserving his creation and guiding it toward his intended purpose. There are two aspects of God's providence. The first act, of preserving his creation in existence, maintaining and sustaining it, and the other is God's activity in guiding and directing 
the course of events to fulfill his purposes. One of the best examples of God's provision and providence is in the life of Joseph, which stretches over 14 chapters in Genesis. This one man's life would go on to affect the lives of countless people and nations. The story of Joseph kicks off in Genesis chapter 37. Joseph is favored by his father and his brothers are jealous of him. So the brothers plot how to get Joseph out of the picture. His father Israel sends Joseph to his brothers who I gather are probably out attending to a flock of sheep. And before he even gets there, the brothers see him out in the distance and begin to plot how to kill him. Joseph's brother Reuben sort of comes to his aid and says, let's not kill him, let's instead throw him into a cistern. With an emphasis of, let's figure out what we want to do with him later. So remember, there's no real planning here. They're flying by the seat of their pants to do whatever they can with Joseph. The brothers are enjoying some good wine and food while his brother sits in his cistern. And this Egyptian caravan comes along and now they think, oh, what do we get out of killing our brother? If we sell him, we can get some money for him. So they sell their own brother for a measly 20 shekels of, shekels of silver, the modern equivalent of about $200. $200 is not very much, but when you want someone out of the picture and you are jealous, you'll do whatever you can. To hide what they did from their father, they slaughtered a goat and rubbed blood all over Joseph's robe to make it seem like he was killed by a wild animal. Joseph is later then sold once more by the caravan to the captain of the guard, one of Pharaoh's officials in Egypt. The brothers think they've gotten the best out of the situation, but as we all know, the story doesn't end there. The story of Joseph has five clear signs of the providence of God working behind the scene and through the life of Joseph. Remember, the providence of God is preserving his creation while directing events to fulfill his will and purpose. The first sign of the providence of God is when Joseph is not killed by his brothers. If Joseph was killed, it would have been the end of the story, although knowing God, I'm sure he would have had another option. But Joseph's life was spared, and although spared, he was quickly sold twice as the common slave. The story continues, we read in Genesis 39, verses 2 to 4. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And the master, Potiphar, saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. Potiphar made him the overseer of his house, and all that he had, he put under Joseph's authority. This is the second sign of God's providence. Joseph has God's favor in overseeing all that is in Potiphar's house. Of course, when somebody is so well favored, someone else will try to get a piece of the action or will do something devious to get back at the person. This happens again to Joseph. As he turns down the advances of Potiphar's wife and her twisting of the truth, lands him in prison. So, so far, Joseph is almost killed, thrown into a cistern, sold twice as a slave, and now imprisoned. But the Lord's favor is upon him, despite all the appearances to the contrary. The story continues in prison. This wasn't just any prison, but a place where the king's prisoners were confined. He wasn't in prison with robbers and murderers and so forth, but with the former elites of society. In Genesis 39, verses 21 to 23, we read, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of prison. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. And the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. This is the third sign of God's providence, that Joseph has God's favor in prison. While in prison, Joseph interprets the dreams of two of Pharaoh's main court, his butler and his baker. And he tells them, hey, remember me and these interpretations when you get up. Even though the dreams are interpreted correctly, they forget all about him. 
About two years have passed and, and Pharaoh is now having dreams and no one can understand what these dreams mean. And the butler finally remembers this guy he met in prison who could interpret dreams. Joseph is pulled out of prison, allowed to shave and clean up. And then Pharaoh says to him, I have a dream and there's no one who can interpret it. But I've heard that you can understand a dream, that you can interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. The dream is seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of extreme famine. Then Pharaoh says to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and as wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And the Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. This is the fourth sign of the providence of God. God's favor upon Joseph to oversee all of Egypt, except for matters of the throne of Pharaoh. Essentially, Pharaoh makes Joseph the second most important man in Egypt, which is pretty remarkable turnaround for a man who's almost killed by his brothers, thrown into a cistern, sold twice, sold by his brothers for 20 shekels of silver into slavery, then sold again, then thrown into prison for more than two years, and now is the second most important man in all of Egypt. If anything says God's favors upon someone, this scenario of Joseph overseeing all of Egypt says it all. We're going to skip ahead in the story. And Joseph, Joseph, like he said he would, took charge of the seven years of plenty and stored up so much grain that during the seven years of famine, Egypt became the sole place to buy grain. The story turns back to Israel and his sons who have run out of food, and so they go to Egypt to buy grain not knowing that it is their brother who they are buying it from. Once Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, he says in Genesis 45, verses 48, please come near to me. So they came near to him. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you here on this earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance, which is a foreshadowing of Moses to come. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout the land of Egypt. Here is the providence of God in action, actually preserving God's select children, his special nation of people, through Joseph and his ability to feed the entire nation of Egypt, plus the nation of Israel for the next five years through the famine. Pharaoh now comes along and says in Genesis 45, 18 and 20, bring your father and your households and come to me and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you will eat the fat of the land. Also do not be concerned about your goods for the best of all of Egypt is yours. This is the fifth and final sign of the providence of God through the story of Joseph. Not only is Joseph honored, but all of God's people are honored. They are allowed to thrive and exist. We know it eventually goes downhill in future generations, but at this time, God's creation is saved and allowed to continue for another day. It is a powerful story of trusting in God, of relying on God to provide and to set into motion a number of events to accomplish his goals and purposes on earth. Paul writes in Romans 8:28, and we know that in all things, that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. That phrase by Paul we see played out when Joseph says to his brothers in Genesis 50, verse 20, but as for me, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about it as it is this day to save many people alive. If God can take a man who almost is killed by his brothers, sold into slavery for $200, thrown into prison, to become the most important man in all of Egypt that saved multiple nations, what can God do with you? 
A while ago at another church, a pastor said something that I've never forgotten. He said, there's no such thing as a coincidence, but rather a God-oriented instance. I like that idea because it better explains the providence of God in the lives of others rather than by occurring by happenstance or chance. That really God is the one behind the scenes aligning events so that his purposes and plans can be achieved. So that he can preserve his creation and his followers. As I listened to some of the stories of these dear Japanese Christians, I saw the providence of God at work. One of the, Jap one of the Japanese Christian ladies to share her story with me was Hiroko-san. She's probably in her late 50s and had a much different story to share. As a little girl, she had a friend who lived next door to a church. She went to visit this friend one Sunday afternoon, and while she was playing with her friend, she noticed all these kids come running out of church, giggling and being happy like kids are. And being an independent young girl, she went up to one of these teachers and asked, what is this? The teacher replied, it's church. Hiroko asked, what do you, when do you next meet? She's like, next Sunday. Can I come? Sure. That was Hiroko-san's introduction to what is now a life dedicated to the Lord. Some people may go, wow, what a coincidence that she happened to be at a friend's house who happened to live next door to a church, and she happened to go there on a Sunday and happened to be outside at the time. But really what happened is the providence of God to order, coordinate an opening for Hiroko-san to go to church. Though she, though I was unaware of God's directing and guiding, but I saw it as I listened to her story of God's presence in her life. I have one other story to share this morning, a story that I believe I may have shared here before, but new details emerged while I was in Japan this past December, and it makes the story even more powerful. After my father passed away in 2017, while attending the cremation ceremony, a friend of my father's, Randy, got up to share about how my dad had affected and influenced him. I knew who Randy was as my dad talked in length about him prior to his death. He shared the story of how he had questions about God and felt compelled to go to this place called Sunny Lounge. And there he saw a white haired, older foreign gentleman sitting by himself. And he thought, I will sit as far away from that man and not make eye contact with him. But I know my dad well, and he, he was the social butterfly. And I feel like he would have made a beeline to Randy. They get to talking and my dad tells him some stuff about God and Randy goes to leave and my dad hands him his contact information in case he wants to talk further. Randy says it took him about three weeks and then he started talking to him regularly about God and faith. The way my father talked about Randy was like they had known each other for years. As Randy shared his story, it was, it was revealed that they met in June and there were three weeks in Randy in which Randy was so frazzled by what my father said to him that he didn't reach back out to him. My father passed away at the end of August, so it was a short span of just over two months of interaction that has forever changed Randy's life. That's the story I knew before I went back to Japan in December, but it's not the full story. The full story is much more powerful and shows the providence of God once again at work. Randy says he was having suicidal thoughts around the time that he met my dad. He was searching to find answers about God, and he had asked his own father, who's probably a non-practicing Catholic, who God is. His father says, essentially, whatever you want to believe is fine. Obviously, that doesn't get Randy anywhere. So he gets home later in the day, and he gets this overwhelming feeling to go to Sunny Lounge that evening. He was very tired. He didn't want to go, but he thought he had to go there that night. He doesn't know why. He had a grueling day at work, but he knew he needed to get there. He goes, he sees my father, avoids my father. My father scoots down and they start talking. My dad said two short phrases to him that changed his whole perspective on life. Randy says, my dad told him, God knows you and God loves you. Randy says that absolutely floored him. He grabbed my dad's info and left. He didn't know how to process that information, and it took him three weeks before he felt comfortable reaching out to my father again. 
They would go on to meet multiple times a week and my father continued to share with him about God. But that phrase he tells me now some five years after the event has changed his whole perspective on life. God makes a way. He always makes a way. If we reach out to God, he will find a way to reveal himself to us. God wants to provide a way for us to know him. He wants to provide for us and will provide for us. The scripture reading in Matthew tells us not to worry about what we'll eat or where because God can provide it for us. If God can preserve his nation through famine, through the wilderness, how much more can he do for each of us? He always makes a provision for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Our time in Japan was exciting to see how God has worked in so many lives, but in so many contrastingly different ways. Japan is such a hard country to reach with the gospel, so every time God moves providentially, it's an important step. In science, we know that for every action, there is a reaction. Things don't just happen. God has planned and provided a way for them to happen. But they won't happen if we don't take the necessary steps to make them happen. Hiroko was given an opportunity that Sunday morning as a young girl, and she stepped into it. Every time we were giving, given an opportunity to share about our faith or to encourage or pray for another person, it's important that we step into it and do so. Because Hiroko stepped out in faith, God responded in kind, and this has led her to a life of devotion to Jesus, a life of faith in God, and a life that is not afraid of people knowing that she is a Christian and is willing to talk with anyone about Jesus. I hope each of you will take some time and think about your own journey of faith. Reflect on the ways in which you see God provision to provide. Reflect on those times that you thought were mere coincidence, but now perhaps you see as God-oriented instances. Next time something comes up that seems like a coincidence, remember it may be a God-ordained moment giving you the opportunity to respond to him. As you reflect on these things, thank God for his hand in your life. Thank him for providing a way for you to follow him. Thank him because you have Jesus in your heart. The providence of God is real and is still at work in the lives of all of us today. The providence of God is summed up in this Don Moen song. God will make a way. Where there seems to be no way, he works in ways we cannot see him. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day, he will make a way. He will make a way. Amen. Please stand for hymn number 406 in the Living Hymns hymnal, God Leads Us Along. Thank you.
Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and it sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please be seated. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come to you this morning, Lord, with our hearts wide open for more of you. Lord, I pray that you will guide each one of us as we seek to follow you more closely, that you would guide our lives and our hearts each day. Help us to be aware of opportunities to share of your great love within a world that is so in need of you. Lord, I pray that you would be with those in our church, Lord, who are ill, who may be in need of healing, may be in need of encouragement, Lord. Pray for those who are shut in and cannot come to church, Lord. May you be with them and give them encouragement this morning. Lord, I pray that you be with our young people and our military and our country and our president. Be with our church, our community, our missionaries and each other. Lord, I pray that you would guide each one of us each day and every day that we would serve you as fully and as completely as we can. Amen. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In thou power and the glory of forever. Amen. We will now receive our offering. Our January mission is Inner Faith. gifts to you to serve your church, to serve the needs of others. Lord, may it be a small representation of our hearts and devotion to you. May you receive these gifts with love and praise. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We will now sing our final hymn, God Will Take Care of You, found in the Living Hymnals, number 579.
God, as we go from here this day, may you guide us all in all our ways. Help each of us to see your presence in our life as we seek to tell the world of the love of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm.